question. Mic too loud? No. Mm. Sounds loud. What? Now I'm not asking for personal. No, it is. Like, it's even louder than it normally is. It's not as loud? No, it is louder than it normally is. Normally it is. Mm -hmm. Too loud? Am I too loud? It's good. It's good. Oh, good, okay. Because I can't always hear myself. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Betty, you can't hear? No, I want to thank you. Oh, go ahead.
for God to bless her with the miraculous birth of Jesus, the Son of God. Why? Because she was committed to purity. If you go back there in the passage to verse 26, right? And 27, you see there, right? We, uh, the angel Gabriel came in Nazareth to this Galilee. Notice in verse 27, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, the son of David. The virgin's name was Mary. You see, Mary was in fact a person because of her faith who was committed to this outrageous idea of purity. I know it seems like an absurd thing in today's culture, doesn't it? But do you realize it was just as absurd in the culture that Mary lived? That even though Mary was living out because of her faith a life of purity before her God, which is what qualified her to be the mother of Jesus, she lived in a culture also that was full of millions of people that were locked into sexual immorality. That was the norm in those days. But for people of faith, people that were looking for the coming of the Messiah, they had a very different commitment. They were committed to purity. Isn't this great the way the angel spoke to her? Continue in verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Why was she highly favored? Why was the Lord coming to visit her? Because it was a high priority in her life, because of her faith, to be a person of purity. Now it says Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But notice this encouragement from the angel again in verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Why was her favor with God? Because she was a person of purity. And I like it how uh, she responds there in verse 34, right? Because Mary's confused. She was committed to purity. She knew that was the right thing to do to prepare herself for the Lord. But this idea of a woman being pregnant without ever having been married to a man and never being with a man, like, this just doesn't make sense, does it? Right? Look at what she says in verse 34. How will this be? Right? We would all ask the same question, I think, if we were in the same position, right? How will this be, Mary asked the, uh, asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Well, the answer to that is, it's precisely because, Mary, you are a person of purity. Because you are a virgin because of your faith. And that's important to you. That's precisely why you've been granted this favor from God. So let's ask this question. What if, what if, what if Mary was not committed to purity? Would she have been ready to meet God? Would she? Mm -hmm. What if a person, if Mary was a person of sexual immorality? Do you think God would have chosen her nope. to birth the Son of God? I don't think so. You see, Mary was committed to purity. And because of that purity, she was ready for the miraculous visitation from God that the angel announced to her. And the opposite is also true, that without Mary's purity, there would have been no Christmas. There would have been no Savior born for us to save us from our sins. So how many people today think that we need another miraculous visitation from God in our day. Look around you, right? You think we need another miraculous visitation from God? Oh, big time. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? See, because this is true. Jesus is coming again. <coughs> Jesus is coming again, but here's the important question, right? Are we ready? Mary was ready, but the question is, are we ready for his coming by our purity, people of faith today? Mary was ready for his coming 2,000 years ago because of her purity, but what about us today? God's church, those who call ourselves Christians, because Jesus 
may be coming soon. He's coming again. We know that for a fact. And it may be soon. But are we ready for his coming because of our purity? Great question that we need to ask. Because when Jesus comes back for his church, will Jesus find us in his church to be people of purity when he returns? Let's look a little bit more at scripture. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. This is uh, part of this passage I read at Christopher and Stephanie's uh, wedding here a few weeks ago. But it talks about this pure and holy bride of Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. First of all, verses 25 to 27. It says, Husbands, love your wives. That's why I read it at the wedding, right? But notice, there's a bigger application, right? Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. How much did he love the church? That's us, folks. He loved the church so much that he gave himself up for her, for this church. But notice what kind of church Jesus died for. Is it a church of sexual immorality and people just doing whatever makes them feel good? I don't think so. Look at verse 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. That's the purpose of the word of God is to wash us and make us clean before God. The word of God cleanses our hearts, makes us pure and holy before God as we yield to the word of God. Notice verse 27 says this, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, blameless. That's how God wants to be able to describe his church, the bride of Christ. But what does that pure and holy church look like? Well, all you got to do is back up in the context of Ephesians chapter 5, and you can see it, right? Paul lays it out exactly. What does it mean for us today to be people of purity for the sake of Jesus, to prepare the way for him to come again? Paul tells us. Go back to Ephesians 5, start at verse 1. He says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. And live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus died for us. We need to be willing to die for him and for the faith and for the good of the kingdom of God. To love people enough to take the chance to do whatever it takes to bring them the faith in Christ. But notice we have to be people of purity. Continue right into verse 3, right? And, uh, of course, most people in our culture today would scoff at these verses. Look at verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Whoa! Right? Are you kidding me? We live in America. We're free to do whatever we want. And God's a God of grace and compassion and forgiveness, so I'm just going to sin, and he's just going to forgive me, and I'm just going to do whatever makes me feel good. Sorry, that's a message from the pit of hell. Because what the word of God says is, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual morality, or of any kind of impurity. We are to be the pure and holy bride of Christ. Not any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. See, God calls us to serious levels of discipleship. He calls us to be people of character and morality and purity. Notice verse 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral person, impure or greedy person, because such a man as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Impure people don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's black and white in the word of God. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient.
obedient. Folks, there's lots of people out there, preachers, so called, that are lying to the people in our culture, telling them, oh, it doesn't matter about sin. Just keep, just do whatever makes you feel good. It's okay. God will forgive you in the end. It's a lie. Notice it says there, let no one deceive you with empty words. There's lots of people out there preaching empty words that are lies from the pit of hell, telling people it doesn't matter how they live their lives, as long as they go to church once in a while. But of such things, God's wrath is coming on those who are disobedient. So what does Paul say? Verse 7, Therefore do not be partners with them. Forget about what the culture says. Do what God says in His Word. Live a life of purity. For you were once darkness, but now you are light of the Lord. Forget about the past. Forget about what our culture is saying. Don't follow the darkness, follow the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. You know what pleases the Lord? People who live in purity. That's what pleases the Lord. Because he wants a pure and holy bride. Verse 11 says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Oh no, I have 200 channels of darkness. I want to watch. Right? Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. That's what the Bible says. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. No, let's just parade it in front of the entire culture. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, and these words I think are words we must shout in America these days. Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And then verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Would you agree with me that the days we're living in today are days of evil? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody say amen or something. Amen. Richie, I need to hear an amen from back there. Amen. Okay. <laughs> we are living in days of evil. Right? So what do we do? Hide under a rock? Hide inside the walls of the church building? That's not what it says there. In verse 16 it says, Make the most of every opportunity. That's what these booklets are about, right? The, the Truth Diary booklets, right? Make the most of every opportunity. Because today, while it's still today, before Jesus comes back, you have an opportunity to reach lost people for Christ. Tomorrow, I don't know. Before this day's end, Jesus could come back. And then it's too late. So the Bible says, make the most of every opportunity now, because these days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The Lord's will is for us to be people of purity, because Jesus is coming again. And we have to ask this question, are we ready for his coming by our purity? Book of uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That's what God expects of us. Because Jesus is coming again. Are we ready for his coming by our purity? This is what it says in Psalm 18. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, verses 23 to 26. Uh, David said this, I am blameless before God. I have kept myself from sin. The Lord rewarded me for doing right because of the innocence of my hands in his sight. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To those with integrity, you show integrity. To the pure, you show yourself pure.
but to the wicked you show yourself hostile. Folks, Jesus is coming again. Are we ready for his coming by our purity? Book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's the Christmas story. What does it teach us to do? Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Okay? That's the filter we need to use for our channel changer. I'm going to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Guess how many channels are left when you say no to that? None. I'm sure... I think you're probably right, Dave. I think probably not. I would agree with that. Right? No to ungodliness and worldly passions. Live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Those words are as true now as when Paul wrote them to Titus. Notice it's in the context of the second coming of Jesus, right? Because he is coming again. Paul says to live those kind of godly lives while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify, there's the word again, for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Have you heard me say this? Jesus is coming again. Are we ready for his coming by our purity? Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to close there. <clears throat> as uh, part of the Christmas story as well. And it's on the front of your bulletin there this morning. This is part of the Christmas story that mentions Mary's example of purity. As we read these words, I would just pray that it would inspire all of us to be people of purity like Mary was, so that we also can be ready for when Jesus comes again. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child. Mary is a person of purity. The virgin will be with child, who will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Even today, God still wants to be with us. But we need to be people of purity in order to honor His presence so that He can come and be with us. So the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? Is this church today, are we today, a pure and holy bride? May we be worthy of his coming by our purity. In the promise at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says this, Yes, I am coming soon. It may be true. It may be today. Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. And we say, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, for your pure and holy bride. Let's pray. <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the word of God and for this person called Mary the one that you chose to be the mother of our Savior. Father, and it is clear from your word of why you chose this young lady to be the mother of our Savior. Because she was a person committed to purity. We thank you, Father, for this example of Mary in Scripture. We know that in her culture, she was surrounded by people of immorality, people of impurity. But yet she chose, because of her faith in you, Father, to be a person of purity, so that she was ready 
for the coming of the Son of God. Father, I pray today that we would follow that example of Mary, because it is clear from your word as well, Father, that for your church, for us here today, and for all brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world, for the church of Jesus, that your desire is for that church to be a pure and holy bride, a people of purity. Father, help us to escape the corruption and immorality of our culture. Help us to stand strong, to be self-controlled, and to live godly lives before you. Father, Jesus may be coming soon. We don't know the time, but you do. And in the meanwhile, Father, I pray that you would give us the courage and the foresight to live every day as if Jesus is coming very soon. And that we would make time to take the opportunity to reach as many people as we possibly can so that we might prepare the way for Jesus. Father, help us to be people of purity in your sight, to be the pure and holy bride of Christ. And we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We pray in his precious name.